Stone Brothers Production. Hello, welcome back to the Serial Killer series in the United States A through Z. Today I'll be talking about the first group of serial killers in California. There were too many serial killers to talk about in one video, so I broke it down. Today I'll talk about eight serial killers in California. I hope you enjoy the video, but let's begin. Number 8. Franklin Lynch, aka The Day Stalker. Lynch was a serial killer that was linked to a series of slangs and brutal attacks on elderly women in the Northern California area in the 1980s. He preyed upon 76-year-old Pearl Larson, 89-year-old Adeline Figueroa, and 73-year-old Adeline Constantine in the summer of 1987 in their San Leandro homes during the daytime. He was convicted on these three murders and was convicted on a few robberies of Hayward area women. Lynch, already being a suspect in a string of robberies and homicides, was a subject of a manhunt a month before the first of the three slangs and was arrested in Los Angeles by FBI agents in October of 1987. He was convicted in 1982 and was sentenced to death for beating Ruth Constantine. After 18 years in his death sentence, he appeared before the California Supreme Court to plead for his life. Meanwhile, he waits for that. A forensic pathologist testified at Lynch's trial saying that Adeline Figueroa died from as many as a dozen punches to the head, neck, face, and suffering brain hemorrhages and a numerous amount of broken bones. Her daughter said the whole situation is a nightmare and her family will continue to wait until Lynch is executed. Number 7. William Jennings Choice Choice was once a kind man from a good family who had money, but she found a problem of him leaving at night and acting normal throughout the daytimes. When he arrived home, he would give Swafford no explanation of where he has been. Deep down inside, Alice always knew something suspicious was going on with her husband. She just didn't know how far the, her husband has actually went under her eyes. Investigators said Choice would pick up prostitutes for sex, and if they didn't accept his cheap offer, he would hold them at gunpoint, rape them, and kill them if they make too much noise and try to escape. Some women have escaped, but three did not make it. The ones that were murdered would be shot execution style in the head before dumping their bodies. Victoria Bell was one of his victims found by a pile of debris by an old truck bay. Gwyn Lee, being one of his victims, was found at a pole barn located in a rural area. She had died of gunshot wounds to the head. People said they knew she was a prostitute, but always dressed classy and had a younger daughter who was devastated about her death. Lawanda Beck was found nude a month later after Gwen Lee's body. Her body was found dumped in a brush. An autopsy report showed that she had been shot and her throat was slit open. She was in and out of foster homes because life became too difficult to bear for her. She started prostitution and died by the hands of choice. He was sentenced to death on December 5th of 2008. Number 6. Robert Edward Morey. Morey lived day by day working at a golf course and sold weed on the side. He suffered from depression and abused marijuana because of being beat and having a bad relationship with his father. Eventually, he had to take out his depression on someone else and he just did that. He was a suspect in the first murder of his roommate, Avril Whedon, in 1985. Police couldn't prove that Murray killed her or that it was he who called the location of the body to the secret witness of Shasta County about a month later. Secret witness was established by a local civic association and was giving reward money to those that gave valuable tips about the local crimes. The caller who inquired a possible reward for the information about weed and murder was never claimed, but a secret witness employee who called to testify that the same person called about one of the murders and about several other crimes. Based on the information provided by the caller, on August 17, 1987, police found scattered decomposed human bones in the Happy Valley area, the same general area where Jacqueline H. had been raped. Although the caller had indicated that the body was that of Alston, the remains were later identified on October 16, 1987 as those of Belinda Joe Stark. On September 22, 
1987, the body of Don Barry Hill was found based on the information and the cops found her body in the Happy Valley area, about three-tenths of a mile of Stark's body and close to the area where Jacqueline H. had been raped. Her body was found under a mattress and surrounded by dense brush and pine needles that had fallen from overhead trees. A scarf was found around the victim's neck and they determined her death was by strangulation and they found a 22 caliber bullet slugged near her feet. Maury was sentenced to death on October 27, 1989 after trying to claim his innocence for these crimes. Number 5. Thor Nis Christensen Christensen was born in Denmark and immigrated to the States at a young age in Inglewood, California. His father ran a restaurant in Solvang, which is noted for its Danish atmosphere. Christensen had a high IQ as a student until his junior year of high school. He began to abuse marijuana, drinking, and neglected his schoolwork. He soon moved out of his parents' house while dropping out of high school and started working as a gas station attendant. During this time, he gained a lot of weight and had a hard time dating women. He became obsessed with fantasies of killing women and having sex with their corpses. He stole a 22 caliber from a friend, which is when his fantasies became a reality. The first to die was co-ed Jacqueline Rook, age 21. She was abducted from a bus stop in Santa Barbara, a suburb of Goleta, on December 6, 1976. The Goleta waitress, Mary Saris, disappeared the same day, and both were still missing on January 18th, when 21-year-old Patricia Laney vanished from another local bus stop. Lanny's corpse was discovered the next day in a nearby Refugio Canyon, and police recognized a sinister pattern with Jacqueline Rook was found dead in the same area on January 20th. No one knew he was a suspect for some time. His fourth victim was Laura Sue Benjamin. Her body was found in a culvert area near Los Angeles Forest Highway and Big Tujunga Road in the San Gabriel Mountains north of Los Angeles. She was reported to have been a prostitute. He had his 22 caliber confiscated from his car because of being arrested for drunk driving. He and among a hundred other suspects in 1977 carried a 22 caliber. All cops needed was Christensen's fifth attempted victim, who survived named Lydia Preston, to go meet Christensen again on July 11th in 1979 in the Bottom Line Bar in Hollywood. She reported him to the police who were standing by her on the call. They captured Christensen. He was charged with four murders and was convicted serial killer who got life, but was stabbed to death in prison by an unknown assailant. Number four, Jurihas Kadamovas and Irie Mika. Kadamovas and Mika are Russian immigrants who lived in the States at the time. Kadamovas was a glass knot entrepreneur trying to forge a new future out of ruins of post Soviet Russia. He moved to San Fernando Valley. Michael met Kadamovas when the latter was working for the moving company. Over time, their friendship turned into a criminal partnership that pivoted on the plot in late in 2001 to kidnap people for ransom. They also hired local muscle, including Einar Altamanis, a Latvian fencer of stolen goods, who told them he had no problem squeezing debaters for money. Kodomovis and Mikhail's first victim was Mayor Luskatel, a valley real estate developer whom the pair had targeted because of his financial success. They used cell phones obtained under false names so they can call and lure their victims into bribes about real estate deals and such. Both assailants would use kidnapping kits, which consists of red duct tape, two kinds of gloves, plastic ties, a gauzy boot covers, purchased with Michael's credit card. When Muscatel walked through the front door, the kidnappers jumped on him and kept him in a room while trying to take all the money out of his bank accounts. The plan went bad and they wrapped duct tape and held him down sitting on him, but he was trying to escape too much and Mikkel twisted the bag around his head until he suffocated to death. They ditched his body in a river afterward, and the body stayed afloat as a local boater spotted the body of Muscatel floating in the Northern California Reservoir. Similar strategies were used with their next four victims. A financial consultant, Rita Peckler, 
whom they hoped to lure a wealthy client into their clutches or even her family, but it didn't work, so they killed her and made another trip to the same reservoir as they did with Muscatel. The next victim was Alexander Umansky, who was a businessman installing high-end equipment and cars once employed by Krill Love. Umansky was killed after his family paid more than $200,000 for his release. They lied about his release to the family and demanded more money after they had already killed him. The kidnappers' attention soon fixed on a Russian businessman, Orhe Safiv, a Beverly Hills magnate who had paired with a would-be filmmaker named Nick Karabadazi, age 29, to make a movie of a famous Russian story about an amphibious man, which didn't last long after both were kidnapped and tricked by the young filmmaker and his colleague going into his fish tank business. They were both held for ransom and another business associate helped pay $960,000 to free both the kidnappers, but it wasn't enough to pay for the $5 million fee to free them. Both were killed and sent to the same reservoir. Their deadly plan to raise $100 million failed after too much evidence linking them to the crimes. They cried and pled that they didn't kill the victims, but the evidence was too strong after a few years both men were sentenced to death on March 12, 2007 and the others that helped them with the crimes were served with their involvement in the crimes as well. Number 3. Gerald Parker Gerald Parker worked as a Marine through seven and a half years of his life. During Parker's career, he was at his Air Force base leaving around and invading homes because of rage and personal issues. He would stalk out homes of his victims before taking action. Parker would choose his victims wisely, which was consisting of only women, mainly those who live alone or are defenseless. He started his slayings in 1978, but it didn't take long till the Orange County, California investigators were on the case. At first, detectives had a thought at first that Kevin Lee Green, the husband of Deanna D. Aiello, who was attacked and put in a coma. He and Gerald Parker were arrested for the crimes because of Parker's DNA all over the evidence and victims. Diana lost her 9 month pregnant unborn child unfortunately, but she survived in a coma and her husband Kevin Green was dropped as a suspect. Gerald Parker was dealt with 5 other murder charges due to detectives learning of the new state database that compares DNA matches to those of 65,000 felons. Parker was matched with 5 victims including an unborn child which raises his kill count to six. They say Gerald Parker would use a 2x4 piece of lumber or a hammer to kill his victims, giving him the nickname Bedroom Basher. He would rape his victims and bash their body and skulls in. Court finally resolved all the murders linked to Parker and think there were maybe more out there. He was sentenced to death on January 22, 1999 for the extreme nature of his crimes and convicted as a serial killer. Number 2. Roger Reese Kibb, aka I-5 Killer. Kibb was middle-aged, bullied by his wife with a lengthy record, including two prison stints for non-violent crimes. In the mid to late 1980s, he went on a serial killing spree that earned him the name I-5 Strangler. He stalked the freeways of South Sacramento during the late nights looking for young women with car problems. The I-5 Killer offers them to help then he abducts them, drives them to a remote location, ties them up, and silences them with duct tape. He then proceeds to cut open their shirts in irregular shapes with his mother's scissors, and then rapes and strangles them to death with their own clothing. He oddly cuts most of their hair off to remove the duct tape before leaving the scene. His first murder was in 1977, which he was accused of killing Lou Ellen Berlay. Then his murdering tendencies didn't come back until the mid-1980s, supposedly. Laura Hedrick, age 21, was his next victim who was last seen on April 20th, 1986 in her hometown, and she got into her car and headed towards Highway 99. Her body was discovered on September 6th, 1986 near Interstate 5, tossed out like a piece of trash. Charmine Sabra, age 26, was the next victim, returning to Sacramento on August 17, 1986, when her car broke down on I-5 in Peltier Road. Leaving her mother with the broken down vehicle, she drove with the I-5 Strangler and a two-seated sports car who offered help. Sabra, the mother of three, strangled body was discovered near Highway 124. 
There was a few other victims, which were Barbara Ann Scott on July 3, 1986, Stephanie Brown, age 19, on July 15, 1986, and Catherine Kelly Quinones on November 5, 1986. His last murder occurred in 1987, which was a 17-year-old Darcy Frackenpol, whose body was found in El Dorado City. Kibb was convicted on that murder on May 10, 1991, and was sentenced to 25 years to life in Pleasant Valley State Prison. In 2003, the I-5 Strangler accompanied prosecutors and detectives to a dry creek he remembered to find the body of Lou Allen Burley, who he disposed of the body in 1977 to avoid the death penalty for the multiple victims. Detectives searched the area again in 2007, but in 2009, Kibb returned to the site and couldn't find the first victim, Berlay, who couldn't have been found before his sentencing on November 5th of 2009. He made a plea bargain of six additional life sentences to avoid the death penalty. In 2011, a detective returned to the same site in hope of finding the last body and found a bone in a creek which DNA testing proving that it was Berlay. Even though he was convicted on seven murders, District Attorney Robert Drossel believes Kibb could have been responsible for up to 38 murders. Number 1. Stephen Wayne Anderson Anderson was born in 1953 in St. Louis, being older of the two sons of a psychologically unstable couple. His father was an alcoholic that had a terrible temper, and the mother not doing anything to help Anderson's younger brother from being beat and abused from his father. She just told them that she dreaded the days they were born. Anderson figured that nothing was going well in his home, and by the age of 14, he was kicked out of his home. While his family moved to New Mexico, Anderson ran into the hill, surviving on his wits, luck, and stealing. He was caught by the age of 18 and put behind bars, convicted of burglary. He then stayed long enough in prison to be on the bad side in prison by murdering an inmate and assaulting another inmate and a corrections officer. In November of 1979, he busted out of prison and invaded the police for some time. On May 26, 1980, shortly after 1 a.m., Anderson, who had escaped from the Utah State Prison, broke into the home of Elizabeth Lyman, an 81-year-old retired piano teacher who lived in Bloomington, San Bernardino County. He ransacked the home and found $112. When he entered the bedroom, Lyman suddenly sat up in bed and yelled out a blood-curdling scream. He fired a shot at close range, penetrating her under her left eye from the distance of 8 to 20 inches away. After covering her with a sheet, he went to the kitchen and made himself a bowl of noodles and then sat down and watched some television. As he was eating and watching television, Sheriff's deputy responded to the call and arrested him. He admitted to murdering because he was startled by her presence. He had no intention in killing her because he thought she was on a vacation. While on trial for her murder and an inmate he killed in prison, he began to write poetry. His high IQ of 136 helped him write and win two Penn Awards, was showcased in an off-Broadway play, and including an anthology of prison writing doing time. Believing he was fully rehabilitated, the professor took up on his cause. Even the most unlikely supporters, the families of the two people he was known to have murdered, called for forgiveness. Around this time, he also confessed to six other contract killings in Las Vegas, Nevada that happened prior to the crime, for which he received the death sentence. He was silent as the time of his execution and did not want to say any final words. He was executed by lethal injection in California on January 29, 2002. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, leave a like, comment, and any suggestions on any new video ideas, guys. Um, the next Serial Killer series, uh, the same California, the next set of group of people will be up on Friday or the week next weekend coming up. So stay tuned for that. And the Maya Op one will be up uh, sometime, maybe Wednesday, Thursday. So stay tuned and I hope you all have a great day.